First Peter 4. I knew it was there. I knew it was there. It's good to see everybody. Um, I finally did it. I put up a new website today. I think Michael's going to put it on the screen. It's www.geofrisbee.com. Pull that up on your phone. Geofrisbee.com. It is mobile friendly. Geofrisbee.com. And I actually made my very first flat earth debunking video. And there's more to follow. What I've done is... I've just kind of gone through the internet looking for sensible videos that give the real, logical, reasonable evidence that the earth is not really flat and when people pressure you to believe that saying that you don't believe the Bible if you don't believe it or you believe Satan's lies or you're calling God a liar which I was accused of the other day I read that on PMO yesterday I read some of the I and mean, that's just a sampling of what I get for not falling for their unreasonable fallacies and, uh, and I'm standing firm on it, and I don't care what anybody says, I don't care what any, everybody comments, you don't scare me, and I know what the Bible says, and I know what the Bible doesn't say. And, and the video that I made today was, I had all these Masonic books that I've collected or people have sent to me over the years, and I said... They say the Freemasons are covering all this up, and yet I've never found anything, any evidence that says that. And then they say it's Satan's biggest lie, which that in itself really makes me angry. The biggest lie to, that from the Bible that Satan tells you is that you don't need Jesus. That's the biggest lie. And what they've done is they've hijacked the gospel, they've hijacked creationism because they say you don't you don't believe creation if you don't believe flat earth excuse me i believe the bible and what it says about the creation i don't find anywhere that in the creation god made the earth a pancake or a frisbee geo frisbee.com geo you know geo like geography G-E-O. And the, the word geography comes from the Greek word geos, which is the earth. Geo frisbee. -E. Yeah. Come on. We grew up in the 60s. We know what a frisbee is. Uh-huh. Geo frisbee.com. So anyway, uh, spread the word, pass that around. And uh, now... On the videos that I make and put on there, I'm disabling comments. And I'll tell you why. It's my playground. If you don't like what I said and you want to argue it, make your own video and get your own website and put it up. I don't care. But I don't have to let you jump in on my playground with your nonsense. So anyway... Uh, that's what, I've, that's what I've been doing. I've, I've had fun. I've had fun with it. And um, the, I, the video I made, I'm not being abusive, not being mean, I'm not being loud or obnoxious. I'm being very reasonable. And I'm just saying, they said these things about Satan and his big conspiracy to cover up the shape of the earth. And I said, it's not anywhere in the Bible. So if you believe that, or you've been told that, then somebody lied to you. And if you think that I'm wrong... Prove it to me. Show me in the Bible where Satan is covering up the shape of the earth. He's not. So, anyway, don't let people get you into that nonsense. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. That's where we are tonight. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh 
hath ceased from sin. Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for a good day. Thank you, Lord, for changing the weather on us and for cooling it down. Father, it's just a little bit easier to work days like this. And by the way, I love the changing of the seasons. I love the fall colors. And I pray, God, Lord, that as the seasons change, you would re continue to remind us, Lord, that we go through seasons in life. And there are days, Lord, like today, where I'm just, I'm in great shape. I'm in a good mood, a good frame of mind, and ready to serve you, Lord. But, Father, I know that there have been days and will yet come again, days where I'm not this way. And, Father, I cling to your hand through all of it. And I thank you, Lord, for all of it. I thank you, Lord, for even the pain. The pain reminds me, God, that this world really is not my home. And Father, whatever my flesh may desire or think that it wants, Father, it can't have it. And I'm going to crucify it. And this body of this flesh is going to die out one of these days. And the things that truly are precious, they will remain. Father, I thank you for salvation. I thank you for new life, new birth. I thank you, Lord, for the blessed gift that you have given to us all. And help us understand, God, that when we are going through trials and troubles, God, it's not because you've left us. Because you promised you would never leave us and you would never forsake us. And Father, I pray, dear God, that we would understand that through sickness, through infirmities, through trials, through suffering... Father, we would be conditioned and armed the way Jesus was armed, prepared to go through it, seeing the glory that awaits on the other side of it. And so, Father, we just pray, dear God, that you would just open up our eyes and bless us with your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and all of God's people said, Amen. Who in here has ever had surgery? By the way, Brother uh, Chris... Um, had surgery today on his, or surgery yesterday on his knee. The surgery came out great, and he, they kept him overnight, and he got to go home. Uh, I can remember when my shoulder went bad because of the electrocution, and I, I got to where I couldn't even hardly play the piano. I couldn't hardly move my arm around like that. It just was in, it was in a lot of pain. And when I went to see the doctor about it, and he was recommending surgery. I said, so what will happen if I don't have the surgery? Because I wasn't looking forward to that. And he said, you'll lose the use of that arm. Eventually, it'll just, it won't heal itself. You'll lose the use of that arm. You've got tendons that are in the wrong place. And they need to be taken out and put back in the right place. And he said, you'll eventually lose the use of that arm. And so what I did was I, I just decided that I needed to have that done. And the day of surgery, I can remember, I was in a very somber mood because I knew what was awaiting me. I knew that I was going to be in a lot of pain for a long time, that I wasn't going to have the use of that arm for quite a while. And then the, I was right about the physical therapy afterward where they have to retrain your arm and restretch your arm to get it to be able to do this because after surgery, I couldn't do that. And they had to stretch all of that out. And buddy, that hurt. But, and for the week after surgery, I was saying to myself, why did I do this? Why would, I'm in worse shape now than I was before. And then three months after surgery, I was telling myself, I'm not any better than I was before the surgery. Six months after surgery, I said, it was the best thing I ever done. And the doctor, I went to, I got tickled because I went to the doctor six months after the surgery and I told him that and he said, and when did I tell you you would feel better? I said, six months. He's, and I said, it's been six months to the day since surgery. And I said, I feel a lot better now. Thank you. But what I had to do was I had to look beyond what I was going to go through and see that I was going to be benefited much better than I was before, and that's what encouraged me to go and have that done. And I'm saying that, I'm saying that because that's what the Bible tells us about Christ. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, we know that he was suffering. He was suffering 
before they ever laid hands on him. He was suffering mentally in anguish to the point that his, I love it, when the humanity of God comes through. Because in the Garden of Gethsemane, the humanity of Jesus said, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup pass from before me. That was his human side saying, I don't want to do this. This is going to hurt. But then, seeing the glory on the other side of the cross said, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And aren't you glad that Jesus looked beyond the cross, saw the glory that was on the other side of it, saw you being saved because he suffered and said, I'll do this if it's just one person that comes to the cross, I'll do it. And he did it. And that's, that's how we are to arm ourselves. Arm ourselves with the mind of Christ saying that if it means suffering, I'll do it. If it means me being uh, down in the pit, down in the dumps, if it means my death, I'll do it. Many people who have been praying for a lost loved one have said to God, God, if it means me giving up my life for them, then so be it. I'll be willing to do it if they are going to be saved. Our patriot soldiers, the good guys, signed up to go and offer themselves. Buster Montgomery, 17 years old, when he found out they bombed Pearl Harbor, went to the recruiting office, lied about his age. You could do that easier back then. Lied about his age, signed up and to offer his life for the defense of his country. Seeing on the other side the victory that was bound to happen, decided to go through with it, and he laid on that submarine thinking every night as those bombs were going off, those Japanese mines were going off, thinking that at any moment he was going to lose his life. Never regretted the decision that he made to go and to serve his country in World War II. Those kind of guys are hard to find anymore. They want instant gratification. They want everything their way without them having to pay for it or them having to suffer for it. Amen? That's that snowflake generation that we're raising up in this country. There's still a bunch of good people that are willing to lay down their life for their country if need be. For the defense of the Constitution of the United States, there's a bunch of good people still in this nation that would be willing to suffer, to take the pain of being wounded, or even die in battle to save their country. Are you one of them? Amen. And what? so what if I die in the defense of my country? How does that benefit me? It doesn't. It benefits my posterity. If I were to just think of myself and how it would benefit me, I wouldn't do anything. But if I think of my children and my grandchildren and possibly their children living in a country where the gospel can be preached to them, just like it's being preached now, I'll do it. I'll do it. Turn to Psalm 77. We're to arm ourselves with this mindset. I, um, I have... All but rejected. Now I'm not rejecting the rapture. But I have rejected the no pain rapture. I reject it. I do not believe that God is just going to zip us out. And then dump everything on the world. That is not where does judgment begin. We're in, chat, we're in uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, in verse 17, it clearly says judgment must begin at the house of God. Why? Because before a man can judge the world, he must judge himself, correct? Before, and God is going to raise us up to judge this world and to judge angels. 
Before we judge the world, we must have judgment on ourselves. We must get our house. If your neighbor has trash all over his yard and won't pick it up, can he come out and yell at you for having trash in your yard? Would be right. If he came out yelling at you because you had trash and your trash can fell over and you didn't see it and you didn't pick it up and he comes out yelling at you about the trash in your yard, you could just say, well, why don't you pick up your filthy trash first before coming and yelling at me? I mean, that would be reasonable, right? And it's the same principle. Before we get to cast forth any judgment upon this world, judgment must begin at the house of God. Judgment must begin in ourselves. It must begin in our homes. It must begin in our church. Before we can, before we pull the, the, the splinter out of somebody else, we must pull the beam out of ourselves. Psalm 77. You know what Psalm 77 is numerically? Huh? It's the, well... The 555th chapter of the Bible. Now, the word Christ, Brother George, is mentioned exactly 555 times in the King James Bible. All forms of the word righteous, like righteous, righteousness, and so on, 555 times in the King James Bible. It's because Christ is our righteousness. And right here in the 555th chapter of the Bible, look at what it says. Verse 6, I will call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? The answer is no. And will he be favorable no more? The answer is no. Is his mercy clean gone forever? The answer is no. Doth his promise fail forevermore? The answer is no. By the way, there's four questions here. How many gospel writers are there? Four. Okay, now think about that. In fact, uh, Psalm 77, it says, Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Turn over to Psalm 89. You'll get an answer to that. Mm, 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 mm. Look at this. Verse 20, I have found David my servant, with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established, mine arm also shall strengthen him. The, what's in God's hand, by the way? The book. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. Think about what your Bible's saying to you, the son of wickedness. Guess who that is? The man of sin, the son of perdition, the son of wickedness, will not nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him, and in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth. My mercy, look at verse 28, My mercy will I keep for him for how long? Look at, and if we look, look up on the screen there, he said, will the Lord cast off forever? And down here he said, my mercy will I keep for him forevermore. There's your answer right there. And my, and then he says, and will he be favorable no more? And then he says in verse 28 of Psalm 89, and my covenant shall stand fast with him. The word fast means like he took a nail and fastened it down and it's there and it's not going anywhere. Remember, Christ is fastened as a nail in a sure place. What did they do to him on the cross? Fastened him with nails in a sure place. Verse 29, his seed also will I make to endure forever and his throne as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and walk not my judgments, if they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, four things. Then will I visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. Somebody say amen. That may, now, 
there's about a billion things that that means. One of them means where he says, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my lips. God says in that verse, I'll never let mistakes creep into the Bible. Never. The, you cannot alter the true word of God. It cannot be broken. It cannot be altered. It cannot be corrupted. Jesus' body lay in a tomb for two days. And God would not allow his Holy One to see corruption. This Bible in its shape has been here about 2,000 years, which is two days in the Bible. And God has not allowed his Holy One to see corruption. Amen? So that's just what I believe. So verse 9. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? See law. And I said, this is my infirmity. I believe that every truly born again servant of God is going to have an infirmity every now and then of asking God, Lord, will you cast off forever? Will you be favorable no more? Will you, is your mercy gone? Does your promise fail? Am I right in that? Have you ever questioned God's favor on you? Have you ever questioned God's mercy on you? I have. Have you ever questioned whether or not the Bible is right in everything that it says? I have. Now the older I get, the wiser I get, and I just, there's not, it's not very often that I get to a place where I'm going, I think God's finally had it with me. I'm not saying I don't ever have bad days. But what happens is I've had this encounter before. And I know that God sustained me through that. And brought me out on the other side. And I'm far better after that than I was before that. It's like having surgery. Necessary surgery. And so I've had it done many times before. Where I've asked, God, surely your mercy has gone from me. Surely your favor has been taken away from me. Surely these things have happened. And then when I get on the other side of it, I see how God had sustained me, how God had held me, how God had kept me. He's not ever let go of his servant, and he never will. We are sons of God. We are his children, and there's no taking away from that. What time you were afraid, God wasn't. What time you were weak, God was strong for you and for your weakness. So David said, this is my infirmity. Apparently David went through this before. And he recognized it. He looked at, it's just like a doctor. He self-diagnosed his problem. He looked at the symptoms. Learned what caused that. And correctly diagnosed himself with a disease. An infirmity. And so he knew then that there was treatment for it, but there was no cure this side of heaven. And that he was going to go through this again and again and again. And he would then remember his song in the night. He would remember how God sustained him and how God blessed him. He would go back and think of days before. So if you look at verse 10 again, I said this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. You know what he's saying there? When this happens again, I'm going to take my medicine, which means I'm going to read the Bible that comes out of the right hand of God. And when I read the Bible, I'm going to see how God sustained his people. How God saved Noah and his family from dying in the flood. How God saved Israel from being killed by Pharaoh and from being crushed in the Red Sea. How God sustained them for 40 years by feeding them angels food cake. Wouldn't it be great, J.R.? 
to every day have angel's food cake. Yes, sir, re Bob, it would. Okay? So this is how God sustained him. He would, he would remember. He would remember how Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace. And not only were they not burned, they didn't even smell like smoke. David said, I would read the Bible. I would, I would remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Now think about this. What was the last thing Satan said in Isaiah 14? I will be like He's got his own version. Amen? He's got his own version. Verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. So here's your medicine. When, you're go when your infirmity inflames back up. I have, I think it's on this side. I have on this side of my neck and my shoulder... A skin thing that pops up about twice a year it gets real red and kind of itchy and it's a big splotch about about the size of my hand and then and Lisa will see it and said what what's the matter with you I said that just happens every about twice a year every year and it'll itch for a while and then after a while it'll scale over and then after a while I won't see it again and won't see it for six months but then sure Nick it's, I don't know what triggers it, but every now and then it just pops back up again. I don't know what it is. I don't want to know what it is. And so far, that's all it does. But it's something that I know is going to recur. Every now and then, I'll get a fungus on my foot. So I keep a can of fungus spray, and I keep a little thing of ointment to rub on it to get rid of it. I know that it's coming again. And I'm ready for it. You see what I'm saying here? This is how you arm yourself. No, you're not going to have perfect days from here on out to heaven. It's not going to happen. But you're going to have good days. And you're going to have cycles of good days. You're going to have good days. You're going to have bad days. Then you have good days again. Then you're going to have bad days again. Am I right? Psalm 119. Turn to Psalm 119. Boy, there's a bunch of stuff in Psalm 119. 170, what, 180 some odd verses? 8 times 22. 8 times 2 is 16, 176. Yeah, that's right. Psalm 119, verse 49. Remember the word unto thy servant upon which thou hast caused me to hope. This is my comfort in my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me. Your word, the word of God puts life back in you when you didn't have any. Amen? Verse 67. Look at this. Look at verse 67. This is exactly what Peter was saying. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Isn't that right? That's exactly, if you go back and look at what he said in 1 Peter chapter, let me get there. Boy, that's getting me excited, man. I love how the Bible's right on everything. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Psalm 119, verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Send that to Benny Hinn. Write that verse down, mail it to Joyce Myers. They tell you that they've learned this from Finnis Dake. They said that affliction is a sure sign that there's sin in your life and that you're honoring Satan with your life. No, that's not what the Bible says. It is good for me that I've been afflicted. I might learn thy statutes. I mean, think about it. How else is God going to get your nose in your Bible where it belongs? Affliction usually does it every time to a real, sincere, born-again Christian. To the fake and phony ones, never. But to the real ones, when affliction comes, they get in their word. They get back in the Bible and they start, re and they start learning things they haven't learned before. I have a preacher friend that has been going through a really tough time. 
and he's coming out of it and he's writing me all the things that he's learning as a result of this. I have been through that before. And I've learned, and I keep telling him, this is what's going to happen next. And sure enough, that's what happened next. How do you know all this? I've been through, I've been here. I am comforting him with the same comfort wherewith I was comforted. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Verse 92. Unless thy law had been my delights, I should then have perished in mine affliction. Did you get that? Remember what I said. The true born-again Christians, when they are afflicted, they will turn to the Word, and it will save them, it will quicken them. The phony ones will not, and one of these days they're going to perish. Some of them, a lady sent me a news article, it was the church that they used to go to, and I think now they watch us online. But they have been following the church. They, they knew that they had a new pastor there. And, and uh, he had been there for, for, a, for a while. I don't know how many years. And then all of a sudden, he went out into a field and took a gun and blew his brains out. Pastor of a church. And everybody was just stunned when they found out about it. Why would he do this? is because the FBI notified him that they were investigating him because of the boys in that church he had molested. And he decided that he couldn't handle that. So he went out and ended his own life because of his own sin. Apparently the law of God was not his delight. And he perished in his affliction. There was a pastor in this county. His young teenage daughter. Got in with some gals at school. And got into lesbianism with them. And this pastor, I just... I always had a funny feeling about him. He was a King James guy. But I just had a funny feeling about him. So he decided to out his own daughter in the church service that morning. And that late afternoon, their house was right next to the church. He said, come on, let's go to church. And she said, I don't feel well. I'm just going to stay home tonight. I think they argued about it, and he finally let her stay home. She took his shotgun, blew a hole in her chest. And I attended her funeral, and her daddy preached her right into the pearly gates. No questions asked, because she got saved when she was five. I'm just saying, when you get afflicted, you're supposed to turn to God's word. Because if you don't, you're going to perish in that affliction. It's going to consume you. It's a disease and it's going to consume you. It's going to kill you. And if you don't have God's word to quicken you, you will perish in it. Verse 93, I will never forget thy precepts. For with them thou hast quickened me. So you know what I can say without any reservation, without any mental reservation, without any thinking about it, I can say to you right now, there is never going to be ever a time when I'm going to walk away from the Word of God. It's just not going, and that's not, I'm not trying to be arrogant, I'm not trying to be cocky, but God has driven me through things that I did not want to go through, and He has always quickened me with this Bible and I just know its power. I know the effects that it has in my life and in my family and in this church. And the people, you guys are still right. I Listen, I love the emails. I got a guy that said he, had, I got a new, a new guy that said he had been Roman Catholic for I don't know how many years. And God saved him and he follows us, watches all the time. I got a letter on my desk from another lady that they finally had to leave their church. And now she says, I consider you my pastor. 
And I take that seriously. But these people have decided to leave everything and stick with the Word of God because they've seen what, what power it has in their life. They've seen what it does. And they've lived their life without it. And they know that their help is going to be in the right hand of God. Psalm verse 120. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. It's exactly how he wants you to have it. That's the spirit of the fear of the Lord right there. You fear God's commandments, knowing what he judicially can do to you. And then verse 153, consider mine affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget thy law. You know what keeping the commandments means? When the devil's trying to snatch... I'm going to make sure I'm not meshing my microphone here. What happened to my microphone? There it is. I thought it rolled down in my belly button there for a minute. The devil will come after you to try to get you to relinquish your sword. In olden times... When a general turned over his sword to the opposing general, what did that mean? Surrender. The captain of a ship handed his sword over to the other captain. That meant we give up. We'd rather, we'd rather be in prison than die in this hopeless battle. Because you are going to kill us and we know it. So we hope to live by surrendering. And that's exactly what the devil will try to do to you. He will try to get you to relinquish your sword. And he'll say, now I'll let go of you and I won't hurt you anymore if you just hand over your sword. What you say to him is, you can have my sword when you pry my cold dead fingers. But until then... This is the only thing that defeats you, so I think I'll hang on to it. Amen. Turn to Psalm 32. Psalm 32. You guys know me well enough to know that I, I tell everybody that the medicine cabinet for the Christian is in the book of Psalms. Maybe sometimes in the book of Proverbs. But in the Psalms, you'll find the medicine for your help. And then... Maybe then you can go to other places and take some extra booster medicine along with it out of the book of John or 1 Corinthians or book of Genesis or 1 Samuel or whatever. But in Psalm 32, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity and in whose spirit there is no God. There's four things here, by the way. I, boy, I remember I saw my cousin was preaching down in Florida and we were down there with him. And he preached this, and I wanted to jump out of that balcony and show him what God showed me. That Mike, there's four things here, and there's four Gospels. That's what I wanted to do. I got real excited. In verse 3, he said, when I kept silence, look at this. My bones whacked old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. In other words, he's cried and sweated so much, he don't have anything left in him to cry. There's no more tears left. And what God has done, God has, in, has uh, inf inflicted godly sorrow. Godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation that needeth not to be sorrowed for. So what God will do when he sees the sins that you have committed and when you're not voluntarily turning those over in repentance, God will make you, he will afflict you. He will put his hand down upon you. His hand was heavy. And remember what Jesus said to us. He said, take my yoke upon you for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And he's not kidding. For us to do the will of God, oftentimes you'll find that it's the easiest thing in the world to do. God will call you to do things that are easy for you to do. Me up here, this is the easiest thing in the world. I don't, hardly don't want to take a check for it. Now don't tell my wife I said that. 
But I'm just saying to you, his, his will is easy for you to bear unless you sin. And when you do, just like we read in, in Psalm 89, when you do, God chastised. We learned about that last Wednesday night. But God puts his hand on you and he will not let go. He will bear down on you. He will keep bearing down on you until you can't. Take it. You'll buckle under the pressure. And now remember, this is like Christ, correct? Christ has got the cross of Calvary on his shoulder, and he's trying to bear it to Golgotha. But what happens? He can no longer, his flesh can no longer bear it. We're to remember that. So it took another to take it up for him and carry it for him. So there's our lesson right there. What God is doing, he's trying to get you to take that burden. That hand is your sin. He's trying to get you to take that burden off and give it to God. And let him have... So read that. After his hand was heavy upon me, verse 5, what did he do? I acknowledge my sin unto thee. And mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Roman Catholic priest and unto Mary and to all the saints. No, that's not what it says, is it? I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Please, if any Roman Catholic is listening to this, please. You don't need the priest. And that nonsense about him not knowing who's in there on the other side of it, don't believe that lie. He knows who you are. And he's not about to forget what you just told him. And the truth of it is, you probably didn't have the guts or the nerve to tell him everything. So even if you still think the priest can forgive your sins in Christ's place, the truth of it is, you didn't tell him everything to begin with. But you don't need that priest. You can go directly to the Lord through Jesus Christ. And the Lord already knows what you're going to confess. So when you say it, he's not going, Oh, I'm so let down that you did that. He was standing, he was there the whole time. And he's going to forgive you. And he said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. See, law. What conditions are here? None. And I've, I've had to tell people who call me or write me, they say, Pastor, I, I've got a sin issue. I've just, I, I can't, I can't get rid of it. It won't, I've asked God, I've tried everything in the world to make it go away. It's not going away. Somebody's told me that I must not be really saved because if I did, I wouldn't be doing this anymore. But I think I am saved, but I'm afraid now I'm going to hell because they said that to me. And I always ask them, did you repent of this to God? And they'll say, yes. I said, I don't even have to ask you, did you mean it? Because I know that you did or you wouldn't be calling me. If you didn't really mean it and you didn't care, you'd just pop off a little prayer and say, well, that takes care of that. Move on about your life, dilly and dallying around and probably get back into it again and think the same thing. All I got to do is read this prayer off and God will forgive it and I can just move on. No, you're calling me or you're getting in contact with me because this thing has not left you and it's bothering you. And you're afraid of what God can do to you. So I don't even have to ask, did you mean it? Because I know you did. So did you ask God to take this away from you? Yes. Well, then why do you think that somebody would tell you that you have to stop doing it and then God will take it away? Because if you ask God to take it away, it means that you couldn't do it yourself. And if you ask God to take it away, and he hasn't, then he has a reason for it. Just like with Paul. My grace 
is sufficient for you. Now, if you really meant it, God knows it. And then God will always do in you what glorifies Him the most. And you may just be the one who is able to say to another sinner, let me tell you something. My God is so good to me that even though I I transgress, I go against what God said, I don't want to, but I have no control over it. I've asked God to take it away, and so far He hasn't, but I know one thing, that every time I've confessed it, He's forgiven me of it. Every time. Well, what about sins you keep repeating? Well, that's really the ones I'm talking about. And I've never seen anything in the Bible where it says if you do it all over again, God unforgives you, pulls it back out of the sea of forgetfulness, puts it back on the book and says, oh, you're still guilty of that. The Mormons teach that. Finnis Dake taught that. That's why he believed in repeated regeneration, that if you sinned and you confessed, God forgave you and he, he imputes righteousness to you and forgets the sin. But if you sin it again... He pulls it back, pulls the old one back out, lays it back on top of you. Now you're lost again. Now you need to get saved all over again. That's stupid. But he believed it. And so do a lot of others. This that crowd that says you can get demon possessed as a Christian. Just don't fall for that nonsense. Amen. And then he said in verse 6, For this shall every one that is godly. Now I would ask you tonight, who in here would like to be considered a godly person? Everybody raise your hand. But who would, knowing yourself, would consider yourself a godly person? No. See, but I can tell you that in itself is what makes you right with God. When you start proclaiming yourself to be godly, you're not. But when God says you're godly, you are. Because God said you were God's word is actually means something for this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in a time when thou mayest be found so by, and by the way surely in the floods of great waters hmm I'm thinking of a time when it's going to be as it was in the days of Noah but the waters are not what's going to be flooding the earth. It's going to be the waves of ungodliness and the waves of iniquity that's going to overflow this world and it's going to choke everybody out except the ones who can walk the sea with Jesus. You like how I threw that book thing in? Okay, the books are still like twenty four ninety five. okay? But... <laughs> Reg would be proud of that. And in time when thou mayest be found, because at some point God does close the door of the ark. And remember what he said to David about Saul and Solomon. My mercy will will I not take from Solomon as I did to Saul. And when God stopped having mercy on Saul, he meant what he said. Because then Saul, after he lied about keeping God's word, and Samuel said, you've rejected the word of the Lord, then Saul tried a pseudo-repentance of it, and God did not forgive him. He was not forgiven. Of his, in fact, it got worse. And David, seeing David, was a reminder to him. Of how God had rejected him. That's why he hated David so bad. And tried to have him killed. Okay. Surely in the floods of great waters. They shall not come nigh unto him. God will have us all walking on water one of these days. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father thank you for a good lesson. God, I'm not saying that we should just all just go out and eat, drink, be merry and sin up. And Because God, I know, I know what will happen to me and everybody else, Lord, who will try that. God, even in my childhood, as 
rotten as I was, there was just things that I knew my mom and daddy would probably kill me over and I just never, never wanted to do it. Other things I did. But God, I'm afraid of you. Because I know that judicially you see me as unclean and wicked because of my heart and this body of flesh that I inhabit. And God, I know, Lord, what you have done to me in the past. I remember the days of old. I remember also, Lord, how you brought me through some of the worst days of my life. I remember, God, how you brought me through, and I didn't think that I was going to make it. And Father, to this day, I stand in awe and wonder and admiration to you about those days. But I'm very thankful, God, for what you've done. I thank you, Lord, for the afflictions that you've laid upon me. And God, I know from time to time my bones are going to hurt again. Now I'm going to be in a bad way. God, I know from time to time my mind is not going to be right. It's going to happen. And God, what I want to do is just put up a false front in front of everybody and make them think everything's okay. But God, you just have not made me capable of doing that. So Lord, I have to be real with these people. But I think that helps them in knowing, God, that if I can be down, then they can too. And God, how you sustain me, even through, Lord, my own self-inflicted infirmities, how you help me and save me and comfort me is how you are going to comfort them in their afflictions. And Father, we may all have different afflictions, but in the sense that they are infl afflictions, they are exactly the same. One of us is not greater than any of the other one of us. For we all have our afflictions and our days where we're not well. And I thank you, God, for calling us godly. If there's anything, God, that could be said that I would desire to be said about me is that I was godly. And I thank you, Lord, for that. I pray, God, that you would help me through my infirmities. And, Father, that you would help these, Lord, in their infirmities. They have them. And I pray, God, the same encouragement that you've given me, the same help, dear God, that you've given me, God, that you would give to them as well, because they're no different. They're not any worse than I am. We're all the same. I pray, God, that you would just help them. Bless your word tonight. We thank you, Lord, for talking to us and for visiting with us tonight. We love you. We ask your blessings in Jesus' name. I did it again. I, we've got to have our prayer time. We've got to have our altar prayer time. Um, Rhonda Stone called me here a while back, said that she was notified that she had skin cancer. And uh, that bothered her pretty bad. And she called me yesterday and she said, Pastor, I've never done this before. I've always just accepted. She said, I saw what the doctor wrote. The doctor wrote on my chart, skin cancer. She said, I just accepted that. But she said, and I called you and I asked for prayer and you put me on the prayer list and everybody's praying for me. And she said, I've just decided to get a second opinion. I went to the doctor and got a second opinion. They actually did a punch incision on me and, and they used this little deal, this little round deal, and they punch a big hole in your skin and pull out that much of your skin and tissue and they run that through and she said, there's absolutely no cancer. And she said, I'm just so excited, I just had to call you. And I said, well, I'm glad you did. So I, she said, just tell my church, she watches, this is her church, she's not able to come here, but this is her church. She said, tell my church family, thank you for praying for me, and that God heard my prayers. Okay? Now, does that mean that God's going to heal everybody? No. He may have something better. Okay? So whatever God wants, just ask Him. All right?